wild. Not sign up. Yeah. Yeah. All but right. Yeah, compared to summer. We're going to kick it off. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, our goal today is an exciting one. We're going to try and discuss and break down fueling for the marathon, uh, specifically fueling for Boston. Um, and one of our goals is Joe and Cody and I were chatting is to maybe open your eyes up to some new strategies or things that you didn't think about that are really going to make a huge impact on not just your marathon, but also on your marathon training, on your buildup. And generally just like one of the things I love focusing on with nutrition is eating things that make us feel good. I feel like that's the only way you're going to be sustainable in your nutrition plan is if you focus on things that make you feel good. Uh, but before we begin, uh, just a quick note, if you just hopped on, go ahead and hit your mute button uh, so we can uh, let Joe kick us off. So Joe, take us away with some uh, strategies for marathon fueling. Yeah. So I am a sports nutritionist and I've actually been diving a lot deeper into this as I'm training for the Olympic trials, but I will say this is a really fun topic and it's really a game changer for so many athletes. Once you learn like how important fueling is around exercise and on race day, um, you know, probably most of you have had some contact with me and most of you have probably heard eat more food. So that's a huge piece to this. Um, so I kind of just want to talk about some basic strategies. And the number one thing I want to emphasize is practicing these things. So you don't want to go to race day trying something completely new that you've never tried before. So the more you practice, the more you can train your gut, the more your body will be ready race day and not be surprised. Um, but let's kind of just like talk for one, just like a basic, like everyday nutrition. So most of you like every day, half your plate when you're eating should be carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are our number one fuel source when it comes to endurance running. We want to be able to tap into that. It's our quickest resource. And most of you, you know, you've probably heard so many different things. So I will say like one thing to focus on is getting enough carbs. This is so, so, so huge for performance. So every day, like on a general basis, you want about, you know, 50% of your plate carbs. They may differ from person to person, that's super important. And when it comes to race day nutrition, we want to actually utilize those carbs for race day. So let's talk about just like race simply, like race day. So when it comes to race day, ideally science has started showing us that we need about 60 to 90 grams of carbs per hour, which is probably significant and probably feels like a lot to some of you. We've even seen some research that shows that athletes can eat more than that per hour. I know in training for Chicago, I was getting up to like 120 grams per hour some days. Um, that was somewhat too, like I was postpartum. So maybe I had a higher demand. We don't have a ton of research on that. But just know like your body can utilize those carbs and you're going to recover faster, perform better. But we don't want to just save that for race day. We want to be practicing that on long runs. I have encouraged a lot of our athletes to practice on like shorter workout days so that your body's getting used to higher intensity and consuming fuel. So your, your gut can be trained and get used to that amount of consumption. Um, but typically let's kind of talk about what that would look like for most of you. So when you're doing a long run or when you're on race day, typically you would want anywhere from about three to four gels, depending on um, what you have access to, what your stomach settles best and how many carbs are in it each gel. So typically we see most gels, like basic gels are about 20 grams per gel, 20 to 25 typically. Um, there's a range, like some are 30, depending on the brand. Um, and then we're starting to see some of these like really, really high caloric or like high um, carb gels, like from Science and Sport or Morton, where you're getting like 40 grams of carbs per one single gel. So you think about that, you're aiming for 60 to 90 grams. Um, that would be like three 20 gram gels um, throughout an hour. So you want to get that in an hour. And then maybe if you're doing the higher gels, you're doing two, um, or adding in a 20 gram as well, you can kind of mix and match, but ideally you're wanting to try to take something about every like 15 to 20 minutes, which for many of you, that may feel like a lot, 
Um, I know for me in training, that's typically around every three miles. I'm like telling you to gel and getting used to that. If you have not been doing that, I would strongly, strongly encourage you start smaller. You know, like if it's like, hey, I'm used to running with a gel and taking one every six miles, maybe start taking it every four or five and seeing how your gut does with that um, and play around and practice. It takes some time to get used to the higher carbohydrate consumption. So be patient with that. Um, I know like <laughs> it, it's kind of wild and you can experience some GI distress if you're not worth used to it. Um, but the more you practice, the more your body gets used to it and absorbs. Um, I also want to emphasize some gels you do need to consume with water. I know goos more likely people are taking them with water, so you may need to consume them. Um, some of the newer gels are coming out that you don't necessarily need water to help absorption, like science and sports is a good example. I've been using that a lot. Um, and they're, they claim, you know, like you can absorb this well, even without water, but just be aware some do absorb better in your body. Um, when you take water with them, sometimes you also <laughs> like textures differ. So like you may find that certain textures don't settle as well, or you need water to get them down. Um, but be aware with that. Um, also, so I don't dive into this with a ton of people because, you know, if you don't have bottle service, it's going to be hard. So you can get calories through liquids um, and we need hydration and electrolytes throughout our runs. That's another really, really key point. Like most of you need at least a minimum of 500 milliliters per hour. If you're in a hotter climate, like I did some testing recently and they're like, hey, when you run in Orlando, you're going to need at least 1300 milliliters per hour for a peak performance, that's a lot. Um, so that means most of you need to be taking water and Gatorade or whatever the race is providing like almost every stop. Um, and if you decide to carry your own fuel source, which honestly can be really beneficial. I know it feels like extra weight, but it can be really helpful for so many people to get peak performance um, because they can get enough electrolytes and enough fluid in there to keep them hydrated. So that's another thing to consider too, where you're wanting to make sure you're consuming enough fluids so you can have peak performance. Um, hey Joe, hey Joe, quick yeah. question on that. Something. This is something that we uh, talked about, and we always talk about. It seems like when we get to nutrition and to the amount of fuel needed, mm -hmm. is the fact that from a coaching standpoint, we want to coach the athletes to practice exactly what they're going to do on race day in practice. And so totally. like, talk about some strategies in terms of like maybe running loops or setting up bottles or, or just like the mental and physical benefit of doing this before you get to race day. hundred percent. I will say like, so again, I did Chicago in October and I honestly do a lot of runs on the treadmill because it's convenient for me and I have bottles. I can always have everything I need on the treadmill. So it takes pressure off when I'm like, hey, you know, I'm a mom with a young kid and I don't have the resources to have someone come be out with me on a bike or to like set up stations. So the treadmill is really convenient. That's my jam because I can control the environment so much more. Um, and I think it was really helpful for me to realize like, hey, I can actually consume a lot of fuel in an hour like i can consume this and my gut can get used to it where it's like my body feels comfortable when i'm consuming this amount of hydration these amount of carbs and i don't have to worry about like oh my gosh i'm gonna stop and go to the bathroom um there's some things outside your control like i still had gi issues the second half of my race on race day in chicago but i still had a great race um but at the same time my issues weren't so bad that i wasn't able to get stuff down i was able to take all of my supplements during race day. And like, I felt good, you know, I wasn't like keeling over or anything. Um, but you know, a lot of that is due to practice. And, you know, there were some, like when I first got started training, like it wasn't as much at the beginning as it was towards the end. I like built up and was like, okay, I, maybe I handled like, you know, 60 to 70 grams at the beginning of my training. And by the end I was like 90 to hundred per hour. And that felt really good for me. I was able to maintain that and I felt good doing it. Um, but it also allowed me to play around with like, hey, like for me, I used a lot of different, well, I tried a couple of different electrolyte beverages and I was like, man, this one really seems to make me feel better. Um, and I'm able to get in enough calories and electrolytes at the same time using that versus like, you know, race day, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm only able to use what the course has, or um, I'm trying to figure out as I go. Like a lot of you can be practicing 
what the course has available as well. Like you usually know when you look it up on the website, they'll tell you what drinks they're going to have. And you can practice that throughout your runs. So then, you know, on race day, like, Hey, this is normal. This is what I expected. Um, and my body can be ready for it. How many days a week do you feel like you need to practice your marathon fueling? Um, if, if you're, if you're training for the marathon and also considering you may not have a marathon specific workout that week. Yeah, so how do totally. you balance that practice? Oh, man. Well, I would always say I have at least one day a week I'm practicing marathon fueling, whether that's like in a long run or marathon specific workouts. Um, you know, most of us have a long run or a marathon workout, or, you know, it can be combined in the same week. I also move things around a lot. So I still ended up managing to do that, but I also, man, I truly believe like track days, speed days, I would always have fuel with me. So like sometimes it was candy, sometimes it was gels or applesauce. I always had electrolytes. Like it might feel like, okay, I'm doing 200 today. This doesn't necessarily feel like I need this, but it was again, another opportunity to practice. And I think that again, helps train your gut, especially when you're, once your intensity goes up, less blood is going to your stomach to help you digest. So it's really helpful for your body to adjust to those higher intensities especially over longer periods of time. I, I feel like that's like the best tip that you could possibly give is to force yourself to practice this fueling. And uh, I was actually watching a video of Clayton Young and Connor Mance the other day. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about the future of the marathon and the future of our sport being in the nutrition side. And and how they felt like uh, Clayton was talking about how he felt like a chemist every morning, mixing his bottles and formulating different things and trying ketones and trying carbohydrates and trying all this sodium bicarb and all this new stuff, man, that is exciting to me to think about like the possibilities of nutrition fueling. And I think training your gut, you, you got to start there. Oh yeah. hundred percent. And I also think part of the nutrition world is every single person is different. So what works for one person may not work for the other. So you have, you have to experiment and see what your body settles well with. Um, cause we can't, like, I wish, unless you're like really rich and can go get all this testing. Like most of us have to see like, Hey, I'm going to try this on this day and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, I got to try something different or, Hey, this actually worked really, really well for me. Now I know I can like tweak it to perfect it. So um, it's just the nature of being human. Like we have to figure out what works for us as an individual. That's awesome. Um, so uh, we'll skip over and Cody, you can kind of take us through some marathon fueling and then we're going to leave like 10 minutes at the end. If you guys do have a question, go ahead and type it in the chat and we will uh, we'll circle back uh, the last last 10 minutes or so. Um, so Cody, take it away with some fueling strategy. Sweet. Thanks, Jay. Um, yeah, so I am Cody Moore. I'm a registered dietitian and a coach here with Run Free. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, Joe is spot on with a lot of the stuff she was saying um, and great stuff there. I don't want to repeat too much of it, um, but if I could give one tip to, to any of my athletes um, and any of you guys that are training for a marathon, it would be that last piece about training your gut and practicing your nutrition. You know, I hear oftentimes from athletes, and I was one of those athletes that said, I don't really need a gel to get through an hour run or to get through a two hour run or to get through this, you know, hill workout or whatever. So I just won't take it. And once I flipped the script to like, okay, how much can I try to practice? How much can I um, train my gut? Um, what opportunities can I take to, um, to be a little bit better about my nutrition and fueling during things, even when I don't need it? Um, man, it, it changed the game for me. Absolutely. I'm able to handle so much more carbohydrate. My stomach is so much happier with that on board. The energy levels are higher. And I've also found like I bounce back and recover from those workouts so much quicker because you're just like not dipping into your energy stores and kind of going to the well, um, quite as deep if you're fueling during those sessions. Um, so yeah, huge tip. And I love that. Um, I guess what I would love to focus on a little bit because, um, because we kind of talked about this as, specific to Boston or, uh, or sort of for people that are, that are building up to the Boston marathon here in April, um, is a couple things that, um, are, are specific to Boston or kind of, um, funny about the way Boston works. And so, 
Um, one thing when I think about Boston is the timing of the race. It's a later start. Um, most marathons, you know, we, we start at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., 8 a.m., something like that. And Boston's like 10, 11. Um, even I think they have waves starting at like noon and one o'clock, depending on where you're seated, um, which is a really late race start for most of us. And you also have to take the bus to get out there. Um, there's some waiting around in the kind of athlete village. There's like a mile walk to the start. So there's all these sort of things that, that, that um, kind of throw a wrench into our normal fueling plans for a marathon that, that happened at Boston. And so um, one thing I really encourage athletes is to practice at least a couple times on a long run or a workout day on the weekend, like practice what you maybe will get up and eat at 8 a.m., and then practice, you know, having a snack at 10 or 11 and then practice, you know, starting your workout at 11 or noon or whenever the race, your, or your wave of that race starts. Um, so you can kind of get your stomach used to that and you can kind of dial in, okay, you know, peanut butter toast works for me, but oatmeal doesn't, you know, I need more time to digest or I need less time to digest or whatever. So kind of practicing some of those intricacies of the start of Boston is really important. And I always, always tell athletes to take a little bit of extra fluids, take a little bit of extra food, more than you think, um, to the start line, because there's a long bus ride to get there. You're hanging out in the village. Um, you're walking to the start. And so having a little bit extra, um, can be really beneficial because it can be kind of a longer time period than you think before you even get to start the race. Um, so that's kind of a cool thing about Boston. Dude, um, I, re I remember when I ran Boston in 2017, I was not prepared for that. I knew the race was later. But like, that is such a good tip. And, and I'm even thinking through like, what could I have done differently? Or what could I tell future athletes to do differently? Man, you know, what would be awesome would be to measure what, like what time you're racing. And I would get in the car and drive for 30 minutes yeah. and then get yeah. out of the car and practice what you're going to eat on the bus. <clears throat> Cause that was a shock. I remember. And then I'm like in this village for an hour, just like sitting mm -hmm. there, like almost going through that could be part of like the internal game too. Like that visualization part of actually putting yourself in that scenario and then eating what you're going to eat along the way. That's awesome. Totally. Um, the other thing, yeah, the other thing, um, is the caffeine timing part. Right. So like I'm a morning coffee drinker, you know, I get up, I have my cup of coffee, like an hour to 90 ish minutes before I go run or before I am going to race. And so that's really normal for me and my body. It's not normal for me to have coffee in the morning and then wait till 11 or noon to, to go race. And so adjusting that a little bit. And what I tell people is like, don't, don't cut out caffeine totally in the morning, but maybe have like a half cup when you get up, you know, and kind of do your thing. Maybe it helps get your bowels moving. Um, and then have like another half cup of coffee while you're on the bus or while you're waiting or, or have, you know, a, a gel with some caffeine in it or a sports drink with some caffeine that you can take on the bus or, you know, when you're waiting in the athlete village, that's kind of in that 60 to 90 minute period, um, that, that your body's used to. Right. And again, everybody's a little different on that in terms of timing and caffeine amounts and all that kind of stuff. But generally like, just think about it a little bit more, just practice it a little bit more because that can kind of throw you off too. Right. Like if you're used to having caffeine in the morning and you have your normal caffeine, and then you have to wait four or five or six hours to go race, like that can really throw a wrench in kind of your energy levels, your psych, that kind of stuff. So just another little piece about that start on the Boston Marathon. And then um, the other things that I think about when I think about some of the peculiarities of Boston is um, the race course, right? So you have a net downhill course that's like pretty easy for the first 15, 16 miles, right? It's kind of rolling downhill and flat. Um, it's not that challenging. Um, and then you get these rolling hills at the end, right? Where the, the effort gets harder at the end. So I often want to think, okay, let's, let's try to front load our nutrition a little bit. Um, let's try to take gels or take our fluids a little bit more frequently at the beginning when we're feeling good, when we're going downhill, when our heart rate's a little bit lower. And then at the end, you don't have to kind of catch up and try to pound some gels while you're going up, you know, heartbreak hill or something like that. Um, and then with that too, I also think about timing, right? And I know that like, for me personally, and again, everybody's a little different on this, but for me personally, when I'm going uphill, like the last thing I want to do is like shove something in my mouth when I'm trying to breathe hard, you know? And so I, I try to time my gels a little bit with like the downhills. And so that when I get over the top of the hill, I can take 20, 30 seconds, kind of catch my breath, regroup, try to relax a little bit, get into a rhythm. And then I take a gel and then I take some sips off a bottle. Um, and when I, you know, when I'm not breathing as hard, when I, when my heart rate is down just a little bit. 
Um, and so just thinking about some of those things and, and kind of how they're different from like a normal flat course um, or, or a different course than Boston, right? Um, and then the other thing I think about when it was Boston and kind of the peculiarities of that course is the weather. Right. Um, I think Boston is so notorious for, for unpredictable weather, right? It could be perfect. It could be really, really hot. It could be really, really cold. It could be windy. It could be like totally still. You just don't know. And so thinking about, okay, like this is my nutrition plan. If everything is perfect weather wise, this is my nutrition plan. If it's really cold, this is my nutrition plan. If it's really hot. Um, one thing Joe said that I kind of want to um, give another idea on is, is taking gels or taking your nutrition, you know, every four miles or, or every six miles, I really encourage people to do it in time. Um, and so every 30 minutes or every 35 minutes or every 40 minutes um, or every 15 minutes, you know, whatever it is, pick a time. Because um, if the weather is really, really hot or really, really cold, right, it might take you longer to run that four miles or five miles or whatever your normal sort of length between gels is. Um, but the time won't change if you're, if you break your nutrition up in time, right? So whether I'm running, you know, five minute pace or six minute pace or seven minute pace every 15 minutes, I'm going to try to take a gel and that doesn't change how fast I'm going. Um, and so thinking about it from a time standpoint is a really nice way, um, so that, that you don't really have to change things up quite as much if the weather is really, really hot or cold or, or whatever. Um, I do want to think too, okay, if it's hot. Um, then we need some more electrolytes. We'll need some more fluids. I want to try to front load that again. So before I'm thirsty, before I'm, I'm getting towards the end, like I'm going to try to take a sip of water, or a couple sips of water, at every single aid station I pass, whether I need it or not, I'm going to try to get something down. I'm going to try to take a little bit of the, the on course drink. If I practice with it, I'm going to take, um, one thing I've done too, in the past that, that can be helpful is just to take like a little disposable water bottle and fill that with whatever electrolyte drink that you like. And just carry that in a hand for the first 5K, for the first 10K, you know, and then at that aid station, you can toss it. You don't have to carry it the whole way, but at least you're kind of front loading and you're, you're making sure you're getting some sips of fluids, sips of electrolytes in, in the first little bit of the, that marathon, especially if it's warm. Um, and then if it's cold on the flip side of that, um, what's going to change nutrition wise? Well, we actually probably need more calories, more carbohydrates when it's cold, right? If we think about like 2018 Boston, when it was like 35 and raining and blowing sideways, um, a lot of athletes said that, hey, they couldn't get warm. You know, even though you're out there running really fast or really hard, you couldn't even warm up just because the conditions were so cold and chilly. And when we're doing that, our body is using more energy, more of that carbohydrate stores um, to keep us warm, right? We might be shivering a little bit or we might just feel a little bit cold. And when, we're, when that happens, we're going to be burning through carb stores more frequently and, and quicker. And so we need to kind of put more on board, right? So just thinking, okay, if the weather looks really cold the day before, let's bring a couple extra gels. Let's bring some extra carbohydrate fluids in a drink mix. If it looks really hot, let's bring some extra electrolytes. Let's bring some, let's try to hit extra fluids, you know, as much as we can. So a couple of things to kind of think about there. That, that is a crazy thought. Honestly, like I never thought about the fact that you might need more when it's cold. And, and I'll tell you, uh, in 2018, uh, an athlete, you guys know very well, Jared Carson was running Boston. I was coaching him and, uh, he's super lean, always been super skinny. And he made the mistake of not bringing enough rain gear sitting in the mm. village and he dropped out at 10 miles because he couldn't warm up. But but what an interesting perspective in the cold, because I think uh, just, um, you know, not really processing the fact that we burn more when it's cold. Like that's that's really lighting something new up in my brain that probably a lot of people have made that mistake before. Thinking that cold weather, oh, it's cold. I'm, I'm good. I don't need... Right. I don't need water. I don't need fuel. It's cold. I'm not even, and here's the other thing people say, I'm not even going to sweat that much. A lot of times you mm -hmm. sweat a ton. It just evaporates and you don't feel it. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think too, with that other piece, um, in the cold weather or in the hot and kind of either extreme, um, we might not feel as hungry, right. And we might not have some of these hunger, these thirst cues, that you know might normally come up for us when we're racing and remind us, hey, it's time to eat. Hey, it's time to drink. 
And so you can set, um, like a lot of watches will have you set like a nutrition alert to beep at you every 15 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever you set it as a reminder, hey, it's time to eat, hey, it's time to drink. Um, and kind of utilizing some of those tools can be really helpful um, because you might not feel thirsty, you might not feel hungry depending on the, the weather conditions, especially in extreme weather. Um, and so just making sure that you have a plan and then you stick to it and that you've practiced it before. Like those are kind of the big key tenets for me. Awesome. Well, okay. So I'll, I'll chime in here and then I want to get some uh, response from both of you guys. Um, so I want to open the door a little bit to some things that I've been doing that I feel like have been uh, really successful and, and like just absolutely crazy changes in my energy. And one of the cool things is, uh, you know, I'm a little bit older than you guys. And so I'm starting to feel uh, some loss in my fitness just naturally through aging. And I've been able to combat most of that through nutritional changes, which is so much fun. And a couple of the things I've been experimenting with and I absolutely love are ketones and sodium bicarb. So uh, a real quick explanation of ketones are produced naturally by your liver, but some scientists figured out how we can eat ketones without having to produce it through a carbohydrate fast. And the best way I think key to describe how ketones work is it preserves your glucose for later. It gives you another energy source that you can utilize that is specific to running further. And when you take ketones, the, the feeling that I get from them is better energy longer. So when I finish a run or a workout, I feel much more recovered, much more uh, stable, in my energy at the end. And uh, then sodium bicarb, I'll talk about that a little bit too. And then I'll tell the amounts and the timing that I like to use for, for all of those. Um, sodium bicarb, there's this product made by Martin. <clears throat> and this is research from like the 1970s uh, where you take essentially baking soda and it buffers your lactic acid. In the 1970s, they knew this worked. But the problem was it would cause massive diarrhea. So you would take it and then would have huge problems. Um, so what Martin did is they created a delivery system for the sodium bicarb where it's little pellets and then a gel and it dissolves lower in the intestines. So it doesn't give you that digestive tract issue. So what it does is it buffers lactic acid, allows you to run uh, at a lower lactate level for longer period of time. Uh, those two products for me have been unbelievable in energy stabilization and utilization. And then uh, Cody, you talked about caffeine timing. And I think it's around an hour 10 to an hour 20, uh, somewhere in that range caffeine peaks. So the timing of all three of these for me, I try to get the sodium bicarb, the ketones, and my caffeine finished somewhere around 90 minutes before the run. And that ensures that I don't have super, you know, full stomach. Uh, the, and, and I want to hear you guys input on that. And I know the sodium bicarb for a marathon, I don't know that we're... Are people using that? Do you guys, Joe or Cody, chime in and, and let me know, do, do people use sodium bicarb for the marathon? Because I haven't seen anyone using it for the marathon, just for shorter workouts. Yeah, um, I can jump in real quick on that. So 
Yeah, my understanding is the sodium bicarb really is effective for for shorter durations of intensity, right? In the marathon, we're not building up a whole lot of lactic acid, right? You're running quite a bit below that lactic acid threshold. Um, usually the, the limiting factor is fueling and then just muscular breakdown and fatigue for people in the marathon, not like the amount of lactic acid that's building up. So would it be beneficial? Like my guess is probably not. I don't really know anybody personally, and I never personally have used baking soda or the, or the um, sodium bicarb for the marathon. Um, but the research is good, like you said, on, on using it for shorter events. Um, and I actually have a great story from college trying to use baking soda, um, you know, just dissolved in water before a workout. And I can, I can attest to the GI side effects. <laughs> it's bad. Um, but the, the new Morton bicarb system, as well as the PR lotion um, brand, which, which uses like a topical lotion to get that in, like they kind of seem to have bypassed some of those GI issues. Um, so that's kind of the, the, my knowledge of the baking soda and sodium bicarb systems. I don't know, Joe, you want to jump in on that? I mean, yeah, I haven't seen any marathoners use it. I've seen 10K, 5K runners experiment with it. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, yeah, again, I, I'm a Cody. I don't know what benefits there would really be. Cool. Um, so uh, what do you guys uh, want to chime in on ketones? Have you guys experimented with that at all? Yeah, I'll jump in on that for a second. Um, so, yeah, the only time I personally have tried them was actually at Run Free Camp. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't notice a massive change. I did feel like, you know, energy levels were pretty good. I actually used them the day after a workout when we went on a, a trail run, um, and felt, you know, pretty decent for, for it being the day after a workout. Um, but that's the only time I've used them personally looking through research on them. It seems like, like one, there's not a ton of research yet, right. It's still a pretty new, um, topic in, in terms of sports nutrition science on, um, it, what they call exogenous ketones, right? Ketones that aren't made by your body, but ketones that you're taking through a, a liquid or a, you know, a capsule or whatever. Um, and it seems like a little bit of a mixed bag, right? It seems like they might help. They might not. Certain studies say one thing, certain studies say another. So it might be one of those things that's individualized, right? Like you have to try it for yourself and see if it works. Um, the one warning, again, like I would say <laughs> with any, any nutrition stuff is don't try anything new on race day, right? Make sure you practice in training, Make sure you practice um, in long runs, in workouts, um, at least one or two times before race day. Don't go to the Boston Marathon Expo or any other expo and pick up some ketones and think this is the magic bullet for tomorrow. Um, because because the research is, is pretty clear that there can be GI effects, um, side effects with the ketones um, and with any kind of new nutrition product, right? So um, it might be something to just try for yourself, see if it, see how you feel on it. Um, and if it makes a difference for you and just make sure that you've trained your gut to be able to handle that. So on that note, real quick, uh, if you try ketones, I have a couple tips to do and, and don't do one is I feel like 30 grams is when you start to feel a difference, which is a lot. It's three, three shots of ketones. It's, uh, 220 calories of ketones. So it's a lot of it's a lot of liquid and it doesn't taste great. And the other is taking it when you take it, start it on an empty stomach. You can eat afterwards, but I'm telling you, you, if you take enough and you do it right, you feel an incredible energy boost. And it's almost like a euphoria that you feel before the workout. Uh, but yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 Hey, on the, on taking it on an empty stomach, is that to avoid GI side effects or is that just because of uh, absorption? Absorption. Yeah. You're going to absorb it. So you absorb it so fast and so well on an empty stomach. It's, it's, I think it's unbelievable. So, um, yeah. Any thoughts on that, Joe? Yeah. I think it's like what Cody says. I don't think there's a ton of research out on it. So I think there's always, um, yeah, it, it's so individualized from first to first and trying things that we don't have research on because um, there have been some studies that have shown GI distress, some other negative side effects. So again, just, again, try it. Don't try it on race day. <laughs> like Cody said, like that is not the time to try something new. Um, yeah. But if you are hey, Joe, you're, try, you're going uh, robotic. Maybe your, uh, oh, nice. your earbuds. Yeah, sorry. Lovely. Um, so, uh, 
Yeah, anybody that wants to chime in with a question in the chat, go for it. Um, I've got hey, one. Hey, Jay, somebody, yeah, somebody just asked one there in the chat about low carb training. Yeah, yeah, go for it, Cody. Yeah, sure. Um, so the question, just make sure I'm right. So um, they're asking about um, sports nutrition and peer reviewed release searches demonstrate the performance equivalency of low carb or keto trained endurance athletes, including marathons and triathlons. They ask, why focus on the carbs? Why not expose runners to the equivalency of low carb or keto based nutrition? Great question. So this is really big, right, in, um, in popular culture for weight loss, as well as it's kind of bled into the sports performance world, right? Low carb or, or sort of that ketogenic diet, which is, which is a very low carb or very carb restricted diet. Um, and this person asked, what about for sports performance, right? And the idea being that, hey, if we can um, train our body to utilize fat more efficiently through a low carb or keto diet, um, that we kind of have an unlimited store of fat, even really lean people have, you know, miles and miles and miles of fat worth of, worth of storage in their body that they could potentially use for energy, right? It's, it's a good question. It's a good theory. Um, the research that I'm familiar doesn't really bear this out for performance benefits, right? What we do see is those people that train on a low carb or keto kind of diet, um, they are really, really efficient at burning fat for energy, right? Much more efficient than somebody who's following sort of a well-balanced diet or a higher carbohydrate diet. Um, but when it comes to actual performance, the performance markers don't increase. And actually when you're following a low car uh, carbohydrate or ketogenic type diet, um, your total power, or your, your max power output numbers actually go down, meaning that you might be able to kind of exercise kind of in this low intensity zone one, zone two for longer and be really efficient at that and utilize less of the carbohydrates that you have stored in your body. Um, but when you actually go to work out really hard, right, or up that intensity, um, you're not seeing a benefit from that ketogenic or low carbohydrate diet. Um, and then just anecdotally looking at like the best runners in the world, right? Um, there's multiple studies out of Kenya and Ethiopia and, and other parts of East Africa, where most of the world's top marathoners come out of. And those guys and gals, they're eating 70 plus percent of their diet from carbohydrates. Um, and so, you know, anecdotally, that makes sense, right? They're like, hey, if the best in the world are doing this, then there might be something to that. Um, and again, the, the research that I'm familiar with doesn't point out a massive benefit especially when it comes to higher intensity, including, you know, sub sub lactate threshold running like marathon pace training. Yeah. There's an important distinction to make there between relative and absolute uh, carbohydrate versus fat uh, yes. burning uh, percentages and numbers. So in other words, if you run at 10 minute pace and that's an easy pace for you, you may burn 30% more fat than you burn carbohydrate. But if you run at an eight minute pace, you may burn 10% more carbohydrate than you do fat, but you're still burning more fat. So that's the difference between relative and absolute. And that's where some of these, uh, you know, uh, people that are trying to sell something uh, are trying to get you into the fat burning zone by going slower when in effect you're burning less total calories and less fat. You just switched your percentages slightly. So they're using the relative percentage to make a point when we all want to run faster and burn more calories. <laughs> you're going to burn more the faster you run, both in absolute, even if the percentages change. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. I think we've got another one. Uh, this one is from Scott Burnham. He says, Cody, on your Kenyan runner's comment, does it matter where those carbs come from, i.e. sugary foods versus whole foods? I'd assume the food in Kenya is different from what we have in the U.S. Yeah, great question here. Um, so they're asking, right, it, you know, in that example of like 70 plus percent of the calories from those uh, from the East African diet coming from carbohydrates, does it matter the quality of those carbohydrates, right? Are we talking, is it mostly like rice and potatoes and bread, or is it more simple carbs like fruit or milk sugars or candy or, or you know, cane sugar, white sugar, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and actually, uh, so a fair amount of, of that, the East African diet of those runners, right, is our, is our complex carbohydrates, right? So our, our potatoes, our bread, um, our whole grains, our, um, you know, starchy root vegetables, 
Um, but actually a fair amount is coming from um, like refined white sugar. Um, and, and if anybody has ever like hung out or spent a lot of time with folks from those higher area elevation areas in Kenya or in, East, um, in Ethiopia, the, especially the Kenyan runners, my Kenyan friends that I ran with in college would drink um, like Kenyan tea. And Kenyan tea is made with milk, um, black tea, loose black tea, and a ton of sugar. And they will drink like literally a gallon of that tea a day. It's, it's a very social thing um, that, you know, when you're hanging out, you're like, you're drinking tea. Um, and it's, and it's very sweet. Um, it's very milky. And so actually like a fairly high proportion of those carbohydrates, not, not like 50% of them. Right. But like more than 10 or 20% of that carbohydrate intake is actually from like milk sugars and, and, you know, white sugar, cane sugar, that's, that's mostly drinking in tea. Um, the, the other kind of addendum that I would add to this, right. Is, um, uh, is another study that um, that came out of actually University of Montana, Missoula, which is close to where I live. Um, and I actually had friends involved in this study and, and they looked at um, a group of trained cyclists and they fed them a calorie matched meal um, that was, I think in one group, right? They got like some salmon and maybe some potatoes and some broccoli or asparagus or something. And then they had another group of cyclists after their workout eat uh, a Big Mac. Right. And it was the same amount of protein. It was the same amount of carbohydrates, same amount of fat in either meal, same amount of calories per, per meal. Um, and they, they fed them this meal after every training session for like four to six weeks. And they found at the end of that study that there were really no changes from one group to the other. Right. So it kind of showed that, Hey, in the short term, as long as we're getting enough calories, getting enough total energy, as long as we're getting enough, you know, carbohydrates, protein, and fat, the source doesn't matter in the short term. Our body's pretty good at utilizing whatever you give it in the short term. Now, obviously long-term, right, there might be side effects or, or changes. Um, but I think one thing to think about or take away from that study and this idea of, of the quality of the carbohydrates um, that we might be taking in is one, we gotta be getting enough to support our training. That's bottom line. And then we can think about, you know, quality and timing. But if you're getting enough, that's, that's what your body needs. Um, so, you know, there's kind of layers to it, right? There's shades of gray here. Um, and we want to make sure that one, we're getting enough carbohydrates or enough calories to support our training and support our body in that. Um, and that's kind of the bottom line. Then we can talk about quality. All right. We got another one. Um, let's see. Uh, it's, uh, so John's shooting you a message about a study, Cody, that you can check out later. About, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah high carbohydrate in keto yeah that's interesting so one one note that i'll put on on that about um which source of food um and this is uh anecdotal and there's also some you know research backing yeah i totally agree with you've got to get the amount of calories in if you're not doing that you're you're going to be in trouble and then the, the source of the calories, the more unprocessed we can get, the better you will feel and the higher your satiety will be. And I think for me, that's one of the biggest struggles is always feeling hungry. And so if I'm getting enough calories and I'm eating unprocessed foods, the satiety level is incredible. And also um, the ability to lean out. Oh, this is a great question. Perfect timing, Kristen. She just asked, what if you have weight you need to lose? And here, this is what I'm actually leaning into. If you go, I would challenge you, Kristen, and shoot me a message. Um, I think we actually, we've chatted before, I know. But um, the biggest thing that you can do to control your weight is get as much unprocessed food as you can, as close to unprocessed, and you will lean out. There's a great study by Kevin Hall. He took uh, 60 participants in his lab. This was a closed lab. He has one of the only nutrition labs in the world that you can come into and stay. And he had people stay for 30 days, two groups. Uh, one group, he said, eat as much as you want. He gave them like 70% unprocessed foods or, or actually closer to 100% unprocessed. 
The other group was 70% processed foods. The unprocessed group lost four pounds in a month. All of their psychological tests were higher. They felt better. And then the processed food group gained four, four pounds in a month and they felt horrible. So over the long term, if you go for real foods, you're going to have a higher level of satiety. And there's a reason that is there are people in labs creating these highly processed foods to make you want to eat more of them. They're super palatable. They're full of the things that make you hungry for more. And in the practical side of it is how many I, I like asking this question. How many sweet potatoes can you eat? Like if you mm -hmm. sat down and you tried to eat as many sweet potatoes as you can, it's really hard to eat one and a half, like one sweet potato and you are full. How easy it is it to eat a huge bag of Lay's potato chips? Super easy. And you're not full afterwards. Like there's way more calories in a bag of Lay's than there is a sweet potato. And so hunting high satiety, unprocessed foods is my go-to for starting that weight loss journey. And then the other thing is you have to eat less than you consume. That's the only way you're going to lose weight. Cody, what do you got on that? Yeah, definitely. No, I absolutely agree with, you know, try to eat more whole foods, right? I think about it as like eat foods kind of in their natural packaging as much as you can, right? Um, but my, my one caveat or my one kind of workaround with that is like, Hey, around training, like that's the time for more highly processed foods, especially more highly processed carbohydrates. Um, one, because we want energy that's a little bit quicker. Right. And again, to use your sweet potato analogy, right? Like it's really great. Like eat that sweet potato for dinner, but maybe don't eat that sweet potato and then try to go run 10 minutes later. Right. It's going to be a little heavier in your stomach. You're going to have a lot more fiber on board. Right. Or try to eat that sp sweet potato when you're out doing your long run. Right. That's the time to utilize some of these more processed foods um, because we, they're going to be quicker to absorb and easier to eat. And they're going to sit a little bit better in your stomach when there's, you know, activity going on either before or after. So that's kind of my one caveat is like, yeah, outside of training, like for sure, you know, more on processed foods, the better for most folks. Um, but, you know, around training, that's the time to lean into some of those more processed foods that are a little simpler to digest. It's almost like you have to have a dual out, duality mindset. You've got to seek out the process when you need quick energy, and then you need to leave that alone when you're not working out. Yeah, I think there's a time and place for all foods. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think there's totally time and place for all foods. I would also say, I just come from an eating disordered background. So if you are struggling mm -hmm. with not eating enough simply, like, dude, processed foods have to fit in your diet. Like, all foods serve a purpose. All foods can work in your diet. Like, most, I mean, honestly, most of the athletes we have coming in here already eat really nutritious diets. And I see a lot of athletes eating lots of fruits and veggies, lots of salads. But dude, processed foods can serve a purpose, especially if you're like really, really high metabolic state. Like if you are someone who needs six, 7,000 calories, I mean, even like five, four or 5,000 calories a day, processed foods can help you get there. And like when it comes to carbo loading, which we didn't talk a lot about, yeah. but processed foods can be a really, really benefit, like big benefit in prepping for race day, giving you simple carbohydrates to store up because a lot of you need like 400 to like 600 grams of carbohydrates a day leading up to a race. And that's significant. So processed foods can be a way to get you there. Um, when maybe like a whole sweet potato cannot because you do fill up too fast. And so, um, when mm -hmm. you need to eat enough processed foods can help fill the gaps when it's really hard to eat enough whole foods. Um, and there, there's a balance, there's a give and take there. It's not all one yep. or the other. Absolutely. Yeah. Time and place for everything. I was just, Jay, if I could add something real quick to that that you hit on that I think is so, so important. Joe, that's great. Love that. And the duality is so vital. So, Jay, what, if we're eating less processed food on a big picture, on a macro idea, here's what's going to happen to me anecdotally and to what you said. I'm going to feel better and I'm going to want to get out at 4.30 p.m. when I'm tired after the workday for that double or that long run just because on a big picture – I feel, I just feel better. I'm not as sluggish. So that's kind of the intangible that I think is, is so valuable on, on, again, on a big picture, going to the less processed foods. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, yeah, guys. So we're, we got a couple minutes left and uh, just wanted to shoot out this message to everyone. So if anybody needs more help nutritionally, uh, we have that like offered to our athletes through run free. And then we have some other services that Joe and Cody and myself can offer. Shoot me a message. Um, best way is uh, just shoot me an email, j at runfreetraining.com. And we'll figure out like the individualized help um, that you guys need. And one of our goals with Run Free is we just really want to serve the athletes. We want to find out where you guys are at as individuals and not, I mean, you heard so many different things here. And we actually talked about this before the nutrition uh, webinar today that we have to talk in somewhat generalities because we can't design one nutrition plan for every one of the athletes that are on this call or every one of the athletes that we work with. So we'd love to help you guys more individually. Uh, just hit us up and we will uh, do our best to accommodate. Uh, any last words, uh, Joe, Cody, anything you guys want to add? Go ahead, Joe. Um, yeah, I would say uh, just thanks for showing up. Thanks for uh, the great questions today. I think there's a lot of things to discuss in nutrition. Um, and if people do want to have more in-depth conversations, then yeah, either um, hit up Jay. Uh, my email is Cody at runfreetraining.com, or you can find me on Instagram at more.wellness.nutritionist um, or through the, through the um, run free, right? I'm kind of linked in on there as well. Um, and would love to continue some of these conversations that people had if you do have more questions. Um, yeah, we want to make sure that you guys are, are able to feel well, um, that you're taking care of your bodies. And, and if you do that, then yeah, you can train harder, you can run faster, you can accomplish some of those goals that um, I know our, our community is super motivated to hit. So. Recording and All right. Well, that's going to end it for today, guys. Thanks for hopping on. We'll uh, we'll have her, this recorded if anybody wants to see it or share it. So have a great day, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.